Hello, everybody. Welcome to our next session. We are in the Citizen Science and Humanities section. Session. We've got uh, three speakers for us today. Unfortunately, uh, Evelyn Mandelflucht was not able to join us, and none of her co-authors were able to step in today. So unfortunately, we won't be able to share um, the findings on public participation in humanities research and their early citizen science on the example of a DBO collection. Uh, hopefully, she'll be able to share her presentation with us at a later stage. But uh, we start the session today with um, Barbara Heinisch, who is a researcher at the Center for Translation Studies at the University of Vienna, Austria. And she has specific experience in citizen linguistics. So she's going to be talking to us about reaching the limits of co-creation in citizen science, exemplified by the Linguistic Citizen Humanities Project on Everyone's Mind and Lips, German and Austria. So with that, I will hand you over to Barbara. And after her 15 minutes of speaking, we're going to use some of the time from Evelyn's talk for some extra questions and answers. So please ask lots of questions in the channel, and they'll be shared with us speakers over here in our staging area. So with that, Barbara, please uh, share with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. I'm going to talk about the limits of co-creation in citizen science, and I will use our linguistic project entitled On Everyone's Mind and Lips German in Austria as an example. So here is the outline. I will briefly talk about participation in citizen science, then about citizen linguistics and our case study about the different tasks citizens have to complete or can complete in citizen science projects, then the comparison of the task in our case study, and finally, of course, the discussion and conclusion shouldn't be missing as well. So when we talk about participation in citizen science uh, in, in academia, it can take many forms. Therefore, uh, different typologies for members of the public uh, who participate in academic research have been proposed. And often cited typologies are those by Bonnie et al. and Heckley, who define different levels of part participation, where the most frequent, uh, most comprehensive form of public participation in research is called either extreme citizen science or co-created projects, according to these authors. Co-creation or extreme citizen science aims at integrating citizens in all steps and decisions in the entire research process. And this also means that it plays an important role in the democratization of research. And here our case study comes into play. Our project addresses the German language used in Austria. Since the German language in Austria is characterized by its diversity and, of course, many local dialects. So one of the objectives of our citizen linguistics project, entitled German in Austria, or here, as you can see, the abbreviation IMDU, very German abbreviation, I have to say. Uh, well, one of the objectives is to test the co-creation approach in linguistics. And in the humanities also, in the citizen humanities. So the project aims at involving volunteers in the entire research process, as mentioned before, the co-creation approach. And the motivation behind this linguistic citizen science project was the fact that language is everywhere. So language is used by everybody, and everybody is confronted with either written or spoken language on a daily basis. So additionally, language and language language varieties, for example, dialects as a variety of language, are an emotional and political topic, and they also refer to person's identity and, of course, also language ideologies. Unfortunately, our plan was a little bit harder to implement than we actually thought. Uh, although language is really everywhere and you have to use it on a daily basis, and IMDU also offers different types of tasks, uh, where citizens could participate, the recruitment of the participants was a real challenge for us. So German is the official language in Austria. But as you can see here, the German language in Austria has many varieties, many different dialect regions, as you can see in the diagram. 
And these varieties may be so different that the people living in the most eastern part of Austria wouldn't understand the people living in the most western part of Austria if they speak their local dialects. So IMDU combines different citizen science approaches and an example that citizen, uh, that language and language varieties are everywhere in Austria are those quotes from our informants. For example, here's one quote. When you talk to other people in Austria, dialects are like the weather. In fact, the most frequent topic in conversations. And here's another quote. My mother tongue is dialect. So you see, language is very important in Austria. So I'm Dieu, our citizen linguistics project combines different approaches. First, the I'm Dieu engages in co-creation with a format entitled Question of the Month. I will go into detail later. But here citizens can raise and answer research questions regarding the perception, the use or the attitude towards German language in Austria. And second, we also have linguistic treasure hunts where people collect and analyze data on linguistic landscapes. In the co-creation approach, the question of the month, we ask citizens to raise the questions about the use and perception of German language in Austria. For the question of the month, the initial attempt to recruit participants via social media and our websites and allow them to enter their questions in a web form, which means, for example, how to write dialect. Why do I trust people more if they speak in dialect? And how does speech recognition actually cope with dialects? All these questions could be entered in a web form, but unfortunately that didn't yield the expected success. Then uh, we had face-to-face -face meetings during science communication festivals. For example, the long night of research or our funding bodies, the Austrian Science Fund Science Communication Festival be open. And during these festivals in Austria, we could collect more than 500 questions about the topic of German in Austria. So about the language use, the perception, and of course also the attitudes. And we also started to engage university students in the research. So we collected all these questions. And after raising the questions, there are two possible scenarios. Either there is already an answer in academia, for example, researchers have already found an answer to it, then they also provide the answer. So it's rather science communication in this regard. But the second scenario is there is a knowledge gap. So the research doesn't have an answer yet. So citizens found this research gap and we encourage them to find an answer on their own, which means going through the entire research process, really from here you can see what was the research question, why did you choose this question, how did you answer it, which means also with which method, method did you use, and what are your conclusions, and how are you going to publish it actually, how are you disseminating it. This means they should use academic means and follow all steps in the research process, from defining a topic to pu publishing the results. As you can see, it's according to a predefined structure, reflecting all the steps in the research pro process. And here is an example for the question, how do you translate dialects? So that was the initial idea that citizens go through the entire research process. They find a question, they find a method, they use the method, and finally they get the result. But unfortunately, that didn't yield the expected success, as, I've had, as I have said before. The co-creation approach was really hard to implement. The limitations identified were that co-creation cannot be imposed by the researchers, which means just if you think that's a good idea, it might not work that well. And the reasons mentioned by the participants why they wouldn't want to participate in more than one research step was either they do not have the time or they lack the resources. That they also said, you are the expert, you are the researcher, you should already know the answer. And of course, there's always the issue, why do you actually need fundamental research? Why, why do you 
don't why do you why do you not engage in applied research actually so that was the first approach the second approach was the collaborative approach through the linguistic treasure hunts and during linguistic treasure hunts citizens take pictures of written information in the public space you can see that can be billboards shop signs street names in dialect in different languages everything is important to analyze the linguistic landscape of a certain region and after taking the pictures they should also analyze it which means saying is there dialect is there a certain language is there a combination of languages where did you find it which function does this text actually have in the linguistic landscape and so on so and now we also compared the different approaches the co-creation and the collaborative approach and uh, these two different approaches have been compared in our study they are very difficult to compare because it, as you can imagine they have different focuses and of course different ambitions so to say and the, therefore the focus was rather on the quantity and quality of the contributions per participant and the overall contribution to academic progress and knowledge gain moreover there were different degrees of voluntariness which you can see in the aspect that university students for example received incentives and bonus points for courses whereas others in the co-creation approach really contributed absolutely voluntarily so the analysis showed that the number of participants differed significantly between the collaborative and the co-creation approach which means between the linguistic treasure hunts and the question of the month and we also saw that the question of the month was able to reach a rather broad audience compared to the linguistic treasure hunts that was measured in the number of participants as you can see here the number of questions raised the number of persons voting on the question of the month on social media and so on and the linguistic treasure hunts on the other hand uh, were mainly conducted with university students and here the majority participated on a almost voluntary basis i would say because they got bonus points in the university course and among the two types of linguistic treasure hunts we offered those with price incentives resulted in a significantly higher quantity of submitted pictures and data than those offering bonus points in a course so to the discussion uh, we still need to analyze um, whether the data quality is negatively influenced by these price incentives uh, and if it also influences the data quantity in fact um, to conclude although citizens are interested very interested in the topic of german language use in austria which is not only documented by the number of questions raised but also the other aspects i've shown the participants are not really willing to participate in more than one research step which was of course very disappointing for us this shows a low willingness to contribute to the entire research process in our case the an analysis of our two-year linguistic citizen science project showed that co-creation seems to be based on personal contact and trust and may the, therefore work best with a small, small number of participants so thank you very much here is information about our project i'm also glad to answer any questions via email thank you very much uh, barbara we do have a couple of questions we've got a question uh, from from petra about the tool that you use to use the treasure hunt what tool did you use uh, we use our cooperation partners app it's called linkscape so it's about collecting pictures of written information in the public sphere and tagging it according to certain criteria and there's two follow-on questions from that where did they send the pictures and how did you analyze them they send it via the app so they really use the app to to uh, upload the data and geotagging is also very important because we need to know where actually the pictures were taken to analyze the linguistic landscape and 
they tagged it according to certain criteria and we analyzed it according to these tags, which for example, which languages are present on billboards, for example, or are street names or signs in tourist regions, are they bilingual, for example, German and English in Austria, or for example, in banks, you can find information also in Arabic or Turkish. So where and when is this information used? And we analyzed it according to this criteria. Thank you. One last question before we move on from Josep. Um, could you expand a little bit on uh, the discussion about incentives? Let's say a little yes. bit more about incentives. Yes. Uh, Basically, we only had incentives for the linguistic treasure hunts. And on the one hand, we used prices. So really, uh, you got a coupon for a, a certain store, or you could buy in an online shop, in an Austrian online shop, or a bookstore. So we had some coupons for that, vouchers for that. And interestingly, this worked better <laughs> than the bonus points for university students. So. This shows that actually people who really voluntarily, but incentivized by price draws, uh, are really more interested or engage are more engaged in actually the linguistic pressure hands than people who um, participated on a semi semi voluntary basis, such as university students. But we only had these two incentives in our study. That's really interesting. Thank you, Barbara. We, if we have a little bit more time at the end, we'll take some more questions. But now I would like to introduce to you uh, Rita Campos, who is presenting on behalf of the coordination of an outreach program held at CES, the Center for Social Studies from the University of Coimbra. And I'm going to attempt to pronounce it in Portuguese, but I'll mangle it at Ciencia Viva at, at CES. And Rita's going to talk to us about citizen social sciences, or the public participation in social science research. So over to you, Rita. Thank you, Margaret. Wonderful Portuguese. I know it's not easy. Uh, so let me see how can I share. So, uh, while well, Rita's digging for her slides, um, uh, the, the team behind the scenes has just let me know we've got peak viewership with this talk, which is fantastic. Welcome to you all. We have 74 people watching us today. Fantastic. Well, I look forward for to hearing all reason. about your dialects. Okay, so I'll... Uh, it was easier during the research, the trial next. No, this is not... Okay. So, uh, as Margaret was saying, I was uh, I'm uh, presenting on behalf of my colleagues, Jose Pedro and Claudia. So we we just recently took the task of coordinating this uh, um, extension program uh, at SES. So SES is the Center for Social Sciences, it's uh, linked to the University of Coimbra in Portugal. Uh, SES' mission is to democratize knowledge, revitalize human rights, and contribute to foster the concept of science as a public commodity. And we do this uh, um, via very critical reflection and, and uh, dialogues among ourselves. And we are a community of researchers from very different backgrounds. So I'm a biologist, for instance. Uh, but we also have these uh, very active links uh, with the, the society. And uh, this uh, particular outreach program is held in collaboration with the Portuguese Agency for the Scientific and Technological Culture. It's called Ciencia Viva. Uh, and the mission, the Ciencia Viva mission, is to promote generalized access to scientific culture as means to the full exercise of citizenships. So Ciencia Viva is responsible for uh, many national-wide um, programs and projects. Uh, one of the oldest is the summer internships that are uh, organized in collaboration with, with uh, research centers and company with a focus on R&D. And they target uh, students, high school students, 
so that they can come to the to to the research centers or these companies and have first hand contact with science so they spend one to two weeks with us and they work uh, with us there so in uh, this the collaboration uh, uh, between cnc viva and sesh started uh, almost 15 years ago but uh, uh, claudia jose pedro and i took uh, this uh, task of coordinating this program uh, uh, last last summer and um, the program be, been running uh, from the beginning with these summer internships but uh, uh, we are trying to diversify the uh, diversify the the um, the type of activities that we promote especially during the, the school year because these summer internships are after the the, the the school year so we are uh, launching a, 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 an activity called Science in Loco where students can come and spend one one day or one afternoon or one morning with us where we choose just one project or one colleague so that they can have this truly immersion and uh, not the interact informally with uh, with with us and we were trying to to launch uh, other uh, other activities but well the covid happens and uh, it's been uh, well it's suspended for now but uh, the 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 programs are, have been very um, open and um, even though we have this this questioning of uh, in social sciences in particular when we, where, where people are the subject of, of study and uh, there's a long tradition of research action projects, uh, it's hard to, to, not to really draw the line between what is uh, just research and what can be considered citizen science. And we, uh, the three of us, start to look at this, as, at these uh, activities that we uh, organize in SESH. And because we give, uh, um, this, this, uh, there's a, a really a nature of participation. So the students don't just come to work with us. They are given, a, 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 they are empowered to think uh, uh, what they want to address, the specific topic they want to address. They are uh, allowed to use our uh, facilities to do research, to talk to other researchers. They go in the street they talk to people and so they decide what that week or that that time that they spend with us will will be so they they are in charge with us to design the research project to design the methodologies to collect the data to analyze the data and to look at the data and try to 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 take some conclusions and so this led us to this uh, debate that we are trying to to um, get more people involved is uh, uh, how can we uh, overcome this limited participation of social science and, and humanities in this uh, what is called uh, citizen science because uh, it's mostly uh, the projects are, are still mainly focused on the on the natural sciences and also how can we go further this this involvement so not not just look at the, at the participation of science of of citizens in science but also uh, research in science uh, and also we have this questioning of uh, how to choose from uh, 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 what would be the adequate format for citizen science participation and also we would like to 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 have this means of assess, assessing or evaluating the, the the program so this is this this communication is more like a like a working progress of a working progress uh, so we are um we have this these questionings we have this uh, this paper is is uh, is from the beginning of, of the well it's it's, it's old but we, we see that this is still uh, something that uh, persists that when we talk about uh, dissemination outreach you know, the, the the promotion of the scientific culture the, we still see a, a lot of, of uh, projects um, in the in the fields of, of the natural science the biomedical sciences uh, and not much visibility 
of the work and contributions from the social sciences and the, and the humanities. And uh, when we go to the web of science and we look for the scientific literature, even though this uh, may not be the, 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 the main reasons for citizen science projects, so this, this, this uh, analysis could be biased for, for uh, projects that produce scientific outputs. But still, there's, there's uh, a lack of visibility of, again, the, the, the social sciences and humanities in, in the citizen science projects. And when, when there's this, this uh, the social science appear, they seem to be more related to the dynamics of the participation and less uh, on using citizen science as a research or data collection uh, method. And we also uh, try to incorporate these two more conceptual dimensions. One is the concept of the ecology of knowledge. That is a concept uh, put uh, by our former uh, director. He, and basically, well, he, he, there's a concept that acknowledges the plurality of ways of knowledge, now ways of seeing the world and interpre inter interpreting the world. And this plurality will be uh, mirrored by the diversity of ways of intervention in the in the real world and so uh, in in this in this within this concept uh, scientific knowledge might might not be the the prime knowledge to to choose for a given situation so it uh, it will depend on the on the context the the the, the hierarchy to 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 choose the knowledge and always trying to uh, warrant participation and then this uh, this uh, citizen social science concept that was put together in a paper that came out last year in the context of uh, climate science is a is a form of um, of giving uh, citizens uh, a key role in all the way uh, all steps of a citizen science project from from uh, from the definition of the question to the the actual policy making so again bringing together uh, what is scientific knowledge or scientific evidence what to with what is public opinion and values and, and the author claims that this is the only way to truly engaged citizens in a, in this case changing behavior to 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 try to minimize uh, climate change so in this in our case we were uh, talking about how can we um, put all these these things together in what we see that what we are trying to put together with this this, this merge of this uh, of this Ciencia viva and sesh uh, missions and aims that is this engage the citizens social science so we we try to expand the concept of citizen social science to include this uh, this uh, this ecology of knowledge so working uh, with and uh, on the society so not be afraid to integrate and use other type of non of, uh, of knowledge besides scientific knowledge and share responsibility from the co-design of research projects to the to the actions uh, in the, in the or interventions in the society and truly consider this engagement to be bidirectional so as i said in the beginning not just citizen engagement with science but also scientists engagement with society so we we started this debate because we would think that the next step for us in uh, in uh, in, in CES, or in particular in this ciencia uh, viva says would be to put forward a research or a research dissemination project designed under a citizen science framework, but to be truly participatory so that we can enhance this dialogue that says has, has been already um, engaged with the, with, the, with the surrounding communities. Uh, we were just starting uh, to, to put up a group a wider group beside the three of us when the the covid when the pandemics come but uh, when we thought about presenting this communication we also thought of uh, including the science the european science community citizen science community in our 
in our debates because we are also sort of new in this in this field so maybe we are lacking some some important information that is already out there but we would like to think of a of a project that could be um, Opera, uh, that, that can be put together with with the mission of, of CES and this questioning of uh, the usefulness of the scientific research and in particular the scientific research that is that is done within the the, the scientific uh, fields of citizen of uh, social science and humanities. Also, uh, we wonder what social universe should be included, namely because we we have this political agenda. Uh, and they have strategies and programs associated uh, and also to what kind of tools can be used uh, to link with what kind of a concept of academic extension that we may adopt so we don't we don't yet know much uh, about what this project can can be but we would like to that could uh, articulate this, uh, this these strategies that we are already uh, adopting in our uh, activities. Uh, but uh, go a little further to this this new perspective of co-construction of knowledge, like all of us being co-learners. Uh, but also going back to the the beginning to raise to that that we can promote this public awareness about the, the, the contributions of the social sciences and the humanities to the scientific culture, but also to, to society. So somehow that the, the outputs of the project could be translated into um, positive uh, inputs in uh, social and, uh, and environmental domains. And we are thinking mainly in uh, school students because they are the, the prime target uh, public in our activities, but we would like to foster the active participation of the entire public, including local actors and, uh, and institutions. And this is, this is our uh, work in progress of a work in progress and we thank our, the financial supports of FCT and SEJ and Ciencia Viva and uh, thank you all if you have inputs they are more than welcome. Thank you Rita that was really interesting we do indeed have a couple of questions from you, for you from the audience uh, the first question is whether you experienced conceptual or epistemological issues in your projects so for example that people are part of the project are subjects and that they give their information or participants which influence the research and shape it and there's a, an addendum to that is in your opinion oh sorry that's that's the question i'm two, putting two questions together so did you experience projects that had conceptual epistemological issues well the the, the project that i was talking about isn't this it does not exist yet but that that can always be a, a, a problem so i think this is one big problem uh, when we talk about uh, citizen science in social sciences because it's it's hard to distinguish to what what are the citizens that we are studying uh, or uh, what are the citizens that we are working with um, like in my case when i organized one of these uh, summer internships uh, i ended up using uh, the contributions of the students uh, to my own research projects so I, i'm not sure if this is a, a contradiction, but um, they they help me to to focus on some some lines that I would like to to follow. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you. We also have a question about uh, what the strategy should be for different to the the approach for different branches of uh, science and citizen science projects. And maybe you can give that a particular Portuguese point of view of what the strategy should be in Portugal for the. Uh, approaching the different branches of science in citizen science? I think that was one is one of the gold questions that we are trying to tackle. So mm -hmm. we, we were trying to put together a group uh, in SESH first uh, to discuss some things, including that. So I, I, I've ne I'm, this is, this is a, I'm quite new in the citizen science world. 
Um, so, because I, since I come from the natural sciences, I had this narrower vision of what a citizen science project would be. And uh, being in a, in a research center in, a, in, in, the, in the social science and humanities uh, wide, widened this, this view, but I, I don't know, I don't have a question. I, I, I don't know enough of, of, the, of the Portuguese panorama to, to, to contribute with a you know, sound opinion. Okay. And one last question before we move to our final speaker. Do you have some ideas about why there is lower visibility of the social sciences in, within citizen science? In this case, I, I, I was based on, on, this, on this paper. It, it came out last year, no, two years ago, I guess. And um, the well, the, the, there was bias for what what could be, and and, and the authors discussed that. So it could be that there are more uh, citizen science projects in the social sciences that don't have scientific outputs that are more interested in political outputs or uh, reports that uh, local stakeholders can use, and so that that. It, then reflects on this low visibility of the, the so these pro these projects will not appear if you search for scientific papers in the web of science. But uh, for instance, in, in this Ciencia Viva, we see a list of, of projects and even though we can see uh, how the social science can contribute to these, these, uh, these themes, like water quality or um, even environmental related uh, questions and even now uh, to, to our understanding of what this pandemic is and what 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 we are facing uh, the debates debates are uh, still mainly focused on on um, like biodiversity uh, medical questions and and so this 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 passes a uh, um, like the social sciences and humanities are these passive um, sciences that, that, like Barbara was saying, this is uh, fundamental research. We, we want um, like active research and research that can be translated in some, some sort of uh, um, step forward on somehow. Oh, I'm not here. Uh, you have the, your phone muted. Ah, oh, I'm on mute. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rita. Uh, if we can bring Matthijs Begijn to the stage now, please. Uh, Matthijs Begijn is uh, the project manager at the Citizen Science Lab at the University of Leiden. And he's also the project leader in the EU Citizen.Science project at the University of Leiden's involvement in EU citizen science. And he's the coordinator of the worldwide uh, Citizen Science for Students GLOBE program. Do we have uh, do we have Matthijs ready to join us? We don't seem to have Matthijs Matthijs ready to join us. Yes, Here we go. fantastic. Thank you, right. Matthijs. Hi, thank <laughs> you, Margaret. With you now. Great to be here, and uh, Margaret. Uh, I know Margaret very well because she's also a member of the Citizen Science Lab that I'm going to talk. About. So that's that's great. Um, should I start now? Or can I? Yes, please go ahead, okay. uh, Matthijs. Okay, that looks better. So um, I'm going to talk about the Citizen Science Lab in Leiden. And you see a little pretty picture here of the city of Leiden, which is a student city in the Netherlands. Um, and we have put together a group of people that work on um, co-creating citizen science projects. Um, oh yeah. First of all, I wanted to give you some, some sunny attitude for this uh, 
Excel conference because this is what it looks like in Trieste at the moment. Very sunny, nice temperature. So keep that as a mindset for the rest of the of the meeting, I'd say. Um, and this is a picture of of, uh, of, the, of our country, the Netherlands, and you see um, Leida, which is close to the sea. You see the, the start of the year, the Dies Natales, with all the professors coming. And this is our team, the citizen science team. <clears throat> so we are a group of people uh, with expertise in the field of citizen science, setting up citizen science projects, uh, investigating the effects of uh, citizen science, how it's working. Uh, we, we all have big networks, etc. And like Margaret said, I am uh, working for the EU Citizen Science Project, which I'm sure you all heard about it, but it's a group of 14 countries working together to mainstream citizen science um, across Europe. And, um, and I am also working on the GLOBE program, but not, as Margaret said, uh, worldwide. I am the coordinator for the Netherlands only, but it's a worldwide program of 37,000 schools uh, working together in hun over 100 countries, investigating the environment and nature, and in this way helping uh, scientists to better understand nature and environment, and in this way, of course, also learning about the environment and nature. <coughs> and it's, by the way, a program set up by NASA. Um, so what is the Citizen Science Lab aiming for? Um, it's a, uh, we support researchers and citizens and societal organizations in co-developing innovative citizen science projects to create new scientific knowledge and engage the public. So we, we really think that citizen science should have both of these parts, really uh, creating new knowledge, scientific knowledge, and also engaging the public. Um, we are currently funded by the by EU Citizen Science because that's the project that I'm working for um, on the on the lab now, and we also are funded by the local government and the university. <coughs> so as a board, we have um, we think it's very important to be uh, interdisciplinary. Uh, so we have a scientific board with um, people from every faculty we have in the university. Uh, they, these are the key, key people that are really interested in citizen science and are working in this field. So that's really great to be able to work with them. Um, a brief overview of the history of the Citizen Science Lab. Actually, it started in 2018 when uh, colleagues of mine, I wasn't involved yet, uh, had three workshops, big international workshops, where people from all over the world got together to, to discuss the opportunities of several fields of citizen science. And this gave us a really good network and a starting position to, to develop the citizen science lab further. Uh, so what have we done last year? Uh, last year, the university existed already 444 years. So that was a reason for a big party. And um, we involved um, citizens uh, in doing citizen science uh, and I'll talk about that later in more detail. Uh, currently at this moment we are uh, implementing the two projects that uh, started last year um, and we are also consolid consolidating the lab uh, by networking and um, raising funds to, in, uh, to have more staff members and do more projects. And we are aiming for 2022 when Leiden will be the city of science, the European city of science, actually. Um, and we want to really co-create a big citizen science project then with citizens. And I'll talk about that later as well. Okay, so the, the first thing is the 444 years Leiden University um, celebration. Um, we thought this was a good reason to, um, to involve the public with um, with science, so we had a call for questions. Uh, anybody in the city could, could send in questions, and we received 50 ideas for research questions um, for citizen science research projects. 
And 10 of these projects, we, um, we thought they were so good that we could um, propose them to a committee. But those 10 projects, we helped those people to really shape the proposals, to, to make them really good and concrete. And then we uh, s submitted them to a committee of, um, of um, employees of the university and the local government of Leiden. And they selected two projects. One is the plastic sputter and one is psychology lab and rules. And I see people are asking, which two projects are we implementing? Well, they are the two projects. And I'll talk about them in more t detail now. <coughs> so the plastic sputter is um, about the plastic soup. I'm, I'm sure you all were all familiar with the plastic soup. It's a, actually, it's a worldwide problem. There's a lot of plastic in the ocean. Actually, there's more plastic particles in the ocean than there are stars in our galaxy. So that's really a lot. Um, and this plastic soup that is that is in the oceans, it comes it main it comes mainly from from land, and it comes from land. It en ends up in rivers and uh, gets into the ocean. And here you see a picture of some plastic in a canal in Leiden. And in Leiden, people are really aware of this. The local government is uh, getting out a lot of the plastic. But it's not enough. Um, also, the local people are really um, uh, worried about all this plastic in the water that is getting into the sea if you don't pick, pick it up. So they are going out with canoes to, to pick up the plastic already. But we wanted to do, or the, 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 the people that wanted to do a citizen science project, they wanted to know where is all the plastic actually going? Um, you know, I said it's coming from the canals in the, in the ocean. But, but in what way is this plastic moving through the canals? How is it, um, yeah. How is it affected by currents, etc.? Um, so what the goal of the project was to map the distribution and amount of plastic in the water bodies throughout Leiden. And in this way, uh, have also societal impact by making people aware about plastic pollution in their local environment and um, hopefully also prevent plastic pollution by informing stakeholders. So uh, that's why it's also really important that we were very well connected with the local government and societal organizations. Um, well, we set up a project. Actually, I have to say that it's my colleague, Lieselot van Bonnet. We'll talk, uh, we will talk about this later in more detail. Um, so we set up an, an app that, with which you can measure uh, uh, the amount of plastic in the canals and send it to a database. We used the Crowdwater uh, app for that. It has been adapted uh, for us especially. Uh, it's an app that was developed by the University of Zurich. Um, and what we thought was really important, uh, because of course the research question had been posed by uh, the local community, but we also wanted to, uh, to have some co-creation in the implementation of the, of the project. So for that we organized some meetings and we uh, participated in several meetings that were organized by other um, groups, uh, for example, the local government or environmental groups. And we, um, we had all kinds of sessions where we asked people what they thought was important and what they thought were the, uh, the main target groups that we should focus on in our communication campaign, etc. Uh, so some of the results of these, this co-creation were that we need to really involve fishermen uh, because they are, of course, near the water. Often uh, people living near the water, boat owners. But there's a lot of things that came out of this uh, co-creation. I'm not going to read them all, but um, I'm sure that you will get the PowerPoint afterwards and you can read them yourself. Um, <coughs> And if you're interested in this really, uh, I think it's a really interesting top uh, project that was set up by my colleague, Lieselotte Rambonet, as I said, and she will do, be doing an e-poster session tomorrow at half past five. It's, it's only five minutes, but um, 
but it will give you a, a much better impression even than I could give you now. And so uh, I recommend all of you to, to attend that session tomorrow. Uh, the other project that we did was the Psychology Lab on Wheels, uh, which is a project where, um, where um, students and scientists go to the, to the citizens in the city of Leiden and The Hague, which is a city close to Leiden, uh, where um, they stimulate the citizens to ask creative research questions and they involve them both as a participant and a scientist. Uh, unfortunately, because of Corona, this this project has really um, uh, has has had some delays, and it's 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 not rolling the, the psychology lab on its wheels yet. Uh, but I hope it will be very soon. Uh, so another uh, example of what we're doing as the citizen science lab is uh, collaborating with other organizations that want to implement citizen science. And one of those organizations is which I think is really interesting is Zon and Wei, which is a, a, a national organization that funds health research in the Netherlands. Um, so it's, it's, it's a big, they have big funds for, for, uh, for health research. And we have helped them with, with some sessions that they did on citizen science because they really want to do something with it and they, uh, they they wanted to put some, some people together to, to find out where are the, the, the big opportunities. Um, one thing that came out of it was that they wanted to, um, they, want, they asked us to organize a training for, uh, for project managers. Um, and we, uh, we advised them to work with their program managers because they have, uh, their program managers are the people that write the, the, the calls for proposals. So they um, are the ones that can write um, in their calls, they can, um, they can um, involve citizen science in their calls. And what we are gonna do with the program managers, uh, we're not gonna train them, we're going to co-create uh, learning materials with them for, um, for the, project managers that will get the funds. Um, so by creating these learning materials, they will uh, learn themselves. Uh, and we will also together with them, help them uh, develop citizen science criteria for uh, when they are reviewing proposals. Uh, so the project applicants that, uh, that want to, to receive those funds from Sun and Ray, they, um, they will get a workshop um, and um, before they submit the proposal, so they can write a good proposal with, uh, with a good mindset of what citizen science actually is. Do I need to stop, Margaret? How much yes, time do got, I have? <laughs> I see your face. We've got three minutes to take a three question. Minutes, okay. So if you wanted to, to wrap up this and then we've got one question for you. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up. Um, so, uh, if a project applicant uh, receives the funds, it will become a project manager, and we will um, help those project managers with the workshop to how to implement the, the citizen science project. But we will also be coaching two of those winning proposals, and in this way, we can really find out how how, how their projects go and what the, the pitfalls are, what they are, and what we can learn from that. Um, so, do I have one minute or should I stop? What do you think? Um, well, you, you either have time to tell us about this slide or you have time for one question. Okay, so give me one question. And so the question is about the use of the, uh, the plastic spotter app or any, any projects that are making use of those kinds of uh, plastics or waste tracking, uh, waste tracking using the mobile phone on an app. And the question is why choose to create something that's local? Uh, does it matter that pollution data is spread across multiple similar platforms? Uh, well, actually, we use the, the plastic, uh, the, the, this app, because it's an it's a app that you can use worldwide, but we used it for a local project. So it's, it's very easy to, to scale this up to a higher level. It's, um, 
the, the infrastructure is there and actually anybody who wants to do this, this in another city can do it as well. So I think we, we, just, we are just piloting and I absolutely agree that it would be a pity to, to just do it local and then build something for, just for yourself and not be able to compare with other uh, local communities and maybe even have several communities along a river to, to monitor see how things develop. So I absolutely agree with that. I cannot hear you, Martin. Thank you very much, Matthijs. It's a shame that there's not more to say about the Psychology, on lab, psychology lab on Wheels project, uh, but many yeah, projects have experienced uh, going on pause as, we, as we're not able to be out and about with, uh, with people in the public as much as we'd like. Uh, so true. thank you very much, uh, Matej. Thank you very much, Rita. And thank you very much, uh, Barbara, for the session today. Um, if I can remind everybody that uh, coming up right after this session is a coffee break and you can join the coffee break. We've got a social room on Zoom where this, uh, the, these conversations can continue. Maybe Matej, Rita and Barbara can join us there. You can continue to ask them questions directly. To get into the coffee break social room, you simply go to the program and click on the program entry for the coffee break and there you'll find a link. So I hope that I'll see many of you on Zoom. Thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you in the next sessions. Thanks, bye. Thank you.